Well, obviously, as you know from my fawning Instagram page, um, I love this show so much. I don't know how to thank you. Allow me to cook for you at my restaurant. And I fell in love with both of you, and it just, honestly, as I wrote, it completely wrecked me. It was so profound, and I'm just very excited to talk to you all about the making of the series and about the book and about your real life experiences. So where do we begin? We begin anywhere you want to. We are so excited to chat with you today. <laughs> well, first of all, but I mean, I guess my first question, Tembi, and then I'll ask Attica, what is your reaction to the reaction to the series? Okay, my reaction to the reaction is I'm 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 I don't have the words. Like I am so moved and I get teary and I'm excited and I'm elated and then I read I people share their stories of loss and it takes me right back. It's like all the feelings. It's all the feelings. And but ultimately it also feels strangely so communal. Like it's so communal that it it's over it's 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 beautiful and breathtaking. It's the only way I can say it. My husband kept coming in the room saying, Maybe you should watch Curb Your Enthusiasm as I was like <gasps> wheezing and not being able to talk and my eyes were puffy, my face was red. Attica, before we get to the story and why it affected me so deeply. You tell me what you think about what people are saying about From Scratch. I have an intellectual answer and a soul answer. The intellectual answer is some part of me, I swear to God, knew it. I knew it from when I read the first, Tempe shared an essay with me before there was even a book, a book proposal, anything. She showed me an essay and I was just like, this is incredible. Your story is incredible. So some part of me knew it was going to hit lots of people. What I think I was not prepared for is what it feels like. And I feel like Tembi, we we did it. It was really hard, but we, we, we touched people. And that's what we wanted most of all, was to reach people and touch people. And so if we've done that, if I don't do much else in my life, I'm really proud of having touched so many people. I think when you realize that this is a true story, it took on such a deeper dimension for me. How hard was it to take something that truly happened to you and transform it into a series? Because, you know, I wondered why did you change your names, for example, and how much liberty did you take with the actual story? And I guess, Attica, let's start with you because I know you were the screenwriter taking from Tembi's book. It was very hard. It, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. And yet, in exact proportion to how difficult it was, was also how easy it was because it felt like a mission. So however hard it was, it meant so much to me to tell my brother-in-law's story, to tell my sister's story, that it's also the thing that got me up every morning. It's the thing that if it's two in the morning, we still got to get a shot off. I got the same level of energy that I had at 10 a.m. Let's do this. Um, so it it was hard, but also it gave me strength. The fact that it was coming from a real place gave me lots of strength. And I'll let Timby speak to changing the names because she was the first one to be like, we got to do that. I knew intuitively, I said, there's no way I can like look up on set and hear somebody call my name. Like, I just can't do that. I need a bit of psychological distance. I need the kind of safety emotionally to go do this next level of the work. And also because the story is about my daughter and it's about my parents. I felt as though I didn't want these on-screen personas for real life people to be beholden to the choices and decisions and actions that these on-screen people make, right? So we just said, let's change the names. And it gave me the freedom to really actually pull from things in my life that aren't even in the book, but put them up on screen and have Amy do them. And, you know, we changed a little bit here and there, but essentially many of the experiences she has are birthed from real life things that happened to me, real life conversations that Sato, my late husband, told me about things that happened in his childhood that I wouldn't have witnessed or seen. Right. I knew, right? And I was like, oh, here's a time to 
put them on screen. You all are extremely close. You grew up in Houston. Talk about your relationship and how it helped this entire process from getting together to writing it, to quite frankly, before that, living it, and then seeing it come to life on the small screen, if you will. Well, Timmy and I take our sisterhood and our friendship pretty seriously. And we work at it as, as if you would work at any kind of a partnership, uh, a marriage, a business partnership, what have you. We just like each other, want each other in our lives. So we want to make sure we know how to communicate. I have an eye. <laughs> and the best thing that happened in doing this together is that we're very different people, but we read each other very well and we complement each other very well. So there are things I wouldn't see that she would see and vice versa. We also can make each other laugh like nobody else. And if you're going to make a series with all of this great drama and sadness, it helps to go into your trailer some days and just crack each other up. We also held each other and cried together. So I just always knew there was somebody I could just look to on set and I knew we were thinking the same thing because we'd been in the same room and these things had actually happened. So I felt not alone. And all of that just gave me more, more, more of myself, more strength. It, it made it all more palatable. It, it just was, and it was strangely, even as dark as some of it was, fun. There was just a lot of fun and kind of reliving some of this and looking at each other like, this is so surreal. How is this happening? One of my favorite scenes was when Z, Attica, says to Amy, Tembi, says, have you showered since the memorial service? <laughs> because to me, that was so funny. It totally broke the tension. And she said something about your funk. <laughs> and I had to laugh because, you know, being sort of having gone through something very similar that you did, Tembi, humor was so important even if it was kind of inappropriate gallows humor but tell me about how you came up with that because it made me laugh so hard and it was so real um J josh oh. allen one of our writers wrote that scene it is one of my favorite scenes in the show and it came from the fact that timmy did for a while not smell very good after Saturn Fast. And we were all a little bit like, who's who's gonna say it? Because it, it doesn't seem like it's a priority, but somebody may need to get in there and say something. And we talked about that pretty openly in the writer's room. Yeah, I was willing to, you know, be vulnerable because one of the things we we're talking about, I mean, this whole show is about, in some ways, especially the, the latter part of the series, is about the feral nature of grief right and that can look different for everyone but for me yeah a shower each day was so low on my priority list when it was like let me just figure out how to like stand upright so we talked about that a lot in the writer's room and yes that moment when 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 that when when that you know we landed on that line when josh came up with that line we we're like that's it we can't hold back like that's and that is so our relationship also we can be in the depths of it and then just crack each other up. Let's talk about Zoe Saldana for a moment because mm. honestly, she blew me away. Sai dove abita tuo cugino Antonio? Certo. Did you work with Zoe on her Italian tembi? I mean, I don't speak Italian, but it seemed pretty, pretty darn flawless to me. Zoe is married to an Italian man. Ah, there you go. That's the only answer I ever have to give. He is married to an Italian. <laughs> so she needed no help from me. Wow, because I was like, that is impressive. But now I know her secret. If you want to speak Italian in a show, marry an Italian. Italian there you, there go. you go. The one thing I wrote to you, Tempe, and I'm going to probably get emotional talking about this, but you all did death really well. Having had a husband who had cancer and having him get sick and be sick for nine months and having to go through this process, I envied the way you all faced it, the way you were such a partner. Tia. Tia. I thought it modeled such strength for other people 
who are going through this. And I'm curious if you can explain how you all were able to, to handle your husband's passing in such a, a beautiful, honest way. Yeah, I think, first of all, Katie, okay, now I'm emotional because the reality is, is that you were always a mentor and a light for me, always. And I had never clearly met you, but I thought Katie did this. Katie raised her beautiful girls. Somehow Katie is doing this. And if Katie can do it, then I'm going to find a way to go forward. So I just want to say that from the outset, that you were very much front of mind for me for much of the journey of Sado's illness. His illness was also 10 years long. So I was his caregiver for a decade. And so by the time we got toward the end of life, when it was very clear that there were no more treatments, clinical trials, those things were not available to us. I had women in my life who were young widows and older widows, and they were whispering things in my ear, right? That I sometimes was not ready to hear. And at other times I thought, if you've done this, you're the only person in my life who knows what I'm going through. So I'm just gonna do what you tell me to do. And I was blessed with that. So I encourage people to have these bigger conversations because they were showing me a way. We also got social workers involved who said, be honest. Right, I, especially with your daughter, which I appreciate it because I went through the same thing because Ellie was just five when, when Jay was sick and turned six before he died. And I so appreciated you showed that social worker giving you advice about being truthful and being honest. You need to help Idalia understand what's happening because her brain will want to forget. For me, I think that moment when Lino in the, in the series says he wants to go home, where there's so many doctors, it's so frustrating. I think that is the hardest moment, I think, when someone's terminally ill, to let go of hope and to embrace acceptance. And that was virtually impossible for me and my late husband. But on the other hand, it was nine months and he was 42. I don't know how old Sara was, how old? He was 51. So you all had had a decade that we didn't have, but I thought that to me, that making that decision to embrace the truth is the hardest thing of all. And I, it seemed to me that you followed his lead on this. Absolutely, I followed his lead, absolutely. And also, I felt as though my daughter needed to see her dad. And at the time, she wasn't allowed in the hospital. There's a cute scene when your dad sneaks her in in the <laughs> yeah. raincoat. Yeah. Hi. But for, me, for us, I felt as that one, he wanted to come home. So I was honoring his wishes first and foremost. And also, if... Zoella, my daughter, could have time with her dad that as a family, we could say goodbye the way we lived in that same kind of closeness. And it was hard. That transition from fight mode and treatment and more diagnostics and attempts, at it, that was a hard pivot to make. Lena, you have a cancer we cannot cure and your liver is failing. But that conversation with palliative care, with a palliative care doctor, and I, I, I can't talk about palliative care enough because you need someone inside of the hospital system, inside of the medical system, to, to talk very openly, directly, honestly, and, and that honors the whole person and the whole family and say, what is actually happening? Because then you can make a decision and you may choose to stay in the hospital. And that is a 
perfectly fine decision for many people. But if not, if you're not given the choice, people sort of don't tell you that the end is imminent. And it was so frustrating when you weren't getting a straight answer and you have all those doctors kind of coming in and out. You Did you really chase a doctor into the parking lot? I had to pull you know, out the information and say, what is actually happening? You know, and I, I often, I said to doctors, talk to me, tell me what you would tell your own daughter. Would you be honest with your daughter? Would, what would you tell your daughter? What would you want her to do with her husband right now? Can you just talk to me like that? If it was your husband, what would you want someone to tell you? And, and that often invited a human moment in, and that's often when I got the most information. And I say that only because we know our care, our caregivers, our doctors, our nurses, everyone is so full, especially now with post the pandemic. And so sometimes just cutting through human to human is can be can offer a life changing conversation. And that was a life changing conversation that that doctor was willing to have with me. And I'm so grateful for that honesty. It was frustrating how you all were sometimes treated at the hospital by some of the doctors. Um, I think they didn't understand because you're a woman of color that you were the wife in the situation. That happened more than once. And I've done a lot of reporting on maternal mortality and the way sometimes hospitals and and some of the doctors and nurses in hospitals but and they don't even recognize their own implicit biases the way they treat women of color and people of color in general and i thought you illustrated that really well too i thought he was only fighting an infection i can only discuss the family are you kidding me I am his family. We are his family. That is Lino's sister-in-law. Do you know who I am? Nurse uh, Courtney. I'm Amy. I am Lino's wife. Were you treated dismissively at times by some of the medical professionals you encountered? Um, I'm emotional with you just asking this question. So thank you so much for putting a spotlight on it. Um, you can tell by my reaction that yes, I was. And it is one thing to be saying goodbye to your husband, to have a small child that you are caring for, and then to also on top of that, be dismissed or be invisible or be presumed to be the hired help. It is beyond insult to injury. And so I, I, we wanted to put that in the series to be very open. And it's not a big moment. It's not a long moment. It's just a passing moment because it happened. I recognized it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I actually wrote on the board, um, on the whiteboard in the hospital, <laughs> when you have to put like, I said, wife, colon, black woman sitting in the chair in the corner. <laughs> so that... I, I needed to claim my role as his wife, you know, and I needed to not have to have that conversation on top of all of the other conversations. How real was Philomena to your actual mother-in-law? Okay, so Lucia Sardo is the actress who plays Philomena. There were times on set <laughs> when I would like look up and I was like, is she channeling her right now? What is actually happening? Her performance is so grounded and so authentic. She, they never met, but Lucia comes from a long line of women, not dissimilar from my late mother-in-law. And she was like, I cannot wait to play this part. And she plays it so quietly, so powerfully. So in so much command and control, <laughs> she is that Sicilian matriarch. And, but there's some nuance and subtle subtleties that are just amazing. So they're very similar. This question is uh, just related to what you just said, Timby. What brilliant person came up with that shot of Philomena's first taste of Insure? It was such a small but instantly recognizable moment for anyone who has walked this path with a loved one. 
Okay, who came up with that? It's from real life, right, Timby? I was from real life. My mother-in-law was like, I don't know what is happening. Why is food, nutrition, <laughs> coming out of this plastic bottle? That is not food. And she, um, you know, and of course I was giving him all the things that, you know, they told us to, to give him. Uh, so yeah, a real moment and played beautifully by Lucia. Someone asked, can you share more of what Sara wrote in his journal? I was curious about that too. Um, and I don't know if you talk about that much, Tembi, in the book. I, I don't. Um, the, I, I don't talk about it much in the book. So because he had been a student of poetry and translation, that is true to my late husband, Sada wrote a lot. And he, he wrote in, in journals, he wrote poems on pieces of paper. And after he passed away, not only did I have his books that were like letters to my daughter, it was messages to me, there were recipes, there were coffee stains, there were wine stains, all the things, right? I found them that he kept over more than almost two decades of the time we were together. But more than that, in his books of poetry, sometimes in the longing and in the missing him, I would pull a book off the shelf to go read like something that he loved, right? And out of it would fall a piece of paper that he had written something. And I felt like they were these little gifts that he was leaving me, you know, in his, you know, in the afterlife, if you will. And we kind of put that together and wanted to illustrate that in the series of how powerful it is. These were gifts that are eternal and keep giving. So if, I always say, write it down. If you can, write it down. <laughs> I wish, you know, I save like check stubs of my husband's. I wish he had written and I save legal briefs that he wrote mm -hmm. and notes when he was diagnosed taking care of sort of things that we had to deal with and i i wish i had journals like you have what a gift for your daughter i think it's a beautiful series not to sound uber cheesy because you all are beautiful people mm -hmm. and i think that's why it works there's something so true about about this and i think that's why it's so affecting Anyway, I'm all the clamped. Uh, thank you both so much for spending time with me. Um, clearly, I loved it. And I hope that maybe one day we'll get to meet in person. That would be so fun. You could serve me ribs and caffeinata. <laughs> Katie, you don't have to ask twice. Yes. I <laughs> love it. It would be a, such a great honor. And I want to just thank you. I won't, I don't, I don't want to leave this call without thanking you again for always being a light for so many, so many, so many people who have lost people in their lives. And I know you were just being Katie and just having your life and doing the best you can and put one foot in front of the other, but it meant a lot and it meant a lot to me. And I probably wouldn't be here had you not Done, made the choices and been so open and so vulnerable in the way that you were. So thank you. Uh -huh. Well, that's so nice of you to say. All right. Well, clearly it's a love fest here, ladies. It's a mutual <laughs> society and we're going to have to meet in person. Thank you so much. And um, for anyone who hasn't seen from scratch, watch it on Netflix and then, or in uh, and read the book, or you can do it in the reverse order. And I hope you all will work together again because somehow the two of you are able to create real magic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.